Welcome everyone, first of all, to the Global Innovation Forum. It's great to be back. Um, I think it was November that I was last sitting in this room talking to, uh, to attendees. And this, this session is part of our What's Next webinar series, where we're tapping into the, the knowledge of our community to help us really better navigate in this climate of uncertainty that we find ourselves in. Our next virtual edition, so that's the sort of main conference, will be taking place in September this year. And we have talks from, as usual, a wonderfully diverse and expert set of speakers. We've got the Gates Foundation with the Senior Advisor for Innovation. We've got Pfizer. We've got LinkedIn and the Head of Mindfulness there. Formula E, um, the Chief Design Officer from the City of Helsinki, um, Microsoft and, and many others. So. Uh, I do encourage you, have a look, giftlondon.com, um, take a look, and we'd love to see you back again in September. But anyway, on to today, and this is the final of our three webinars, and I hope some of you have uh, enjoyed all of them, but I think I can safely say that we've saved the best till last. I'm delighted to welcome Catalina Czernica. Catalina is CEO of the Health and Happiness Research Foundation. And uh, that aims to accelerate the adoption of happiness measures and frameworks in the design and delivery of healthcare. But Catalina, I'll let you talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, it's a particularly timely talk because I'm sure as many of you spotted, the World Happiness Report for 2021 was released on Saturday and full of fascinating insights into how the world has been coping with, with COVID and what the impact has been on, on sort of general populations and, and, and their happiness. So I'm sure that's something that we'll, we'll talk, a, talk about. Just a little bit more about Catalina. Catalina co-founded the Happiness Studies in, uh, in the Leo Innovation Lab, which is a big pharmaceutical, part of a big pharmaceutical company um, in Denmark, renowned as a very happy uh, land. And later that span out as the Independent Health and Happiness Research Foundation. Um, she's in her work been awarded the patient champion at IFA Pharma in 2019 for her work on the first ever world psoriasis happiness reports. And she's got an MBA from Oxford, uh, the Said Business School, and a specialism in innovation, which uh, is brilliant to have you at GIFT. So, Catalina, thank you very much for joining us. It's great to have you. Thank you for the introduction. That was very kind. Thank you. Well, listen, I'd love to start off because, you know, we're, we're going to cover all sorts of things, but how did you get into kind of the, the wonderful world of happiness? How do you find yourself here? I think the short answer would be um, because I said yes. You know, like, like you kind of like uh, already alluded to, my whole career has been somehow happening by embracing multidisciplinary challenges right you now from starting in the creative world and going through the world of um, service design and uh, user-led design and towards the technology uh, delivery world so when we were in um, leo innovation lab because our vision there was to improve the lives of people living with skin conditions okay. we were looking at alternative ways to measure the impact our digital solutions have on people's lives. And it was supposed to be a small internal tool for our team to, right. to measure happiness. And because of my background and because it was a little bit of a quirky subject, you know, yes. I still remember the meeting where I just raised and I was like, I'll, I'll do it. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I don't know anything about it, but I'll do it. Yes. And it's, and I've, I've been, you know, I've been hooked since then. I think that was more than four years ago now. And I've been hooked because it's such a rich subject. And yeah. I think it touches so many areas of our lives, you know, personal level, work level, as a community, as a society. So I, I love it. Fantastic. No, I love that idea of saying yes. I think innovators have to be people who say yes, right? That's, that's, our, that's our job. And I mean, I remember listening to a, a podcast and, and they were talking about happiness and saying that actually the reason we didn't start measuring happiness rather than GDP was because it's a lot more complicated to measure. But, but maybe if we can start with, 
you know, let's define happiness because it can mean to some people, it can mean a tub of Ben and Jerry's and the box set. Right. But, yeah. but how should we define it and how, how should we measure it? I think it's, I think you're absolutely right. And every time I talk about happiness, we start by having this kind of debate. It's like, right. it, it's hard, you know, for me, it's different. Then I'm sure that my happiness is different than yours. And it depends yeah. on so many um, aspects of our day. You know, it's sunnier today. So probably we have a bit of a better day, you know, so it's, but that is, and it's normal to start there because it's very close to, to us. But that is what in the scientific literature, it's actually called hedonia. And mm -hmm. it's focusing on, you know, the presence of positive emotions and the absence of negative emotions. Okay. You know, hence this idea of hedonistic pleasures and just seeking only positive emotions, which is kind of uh, unrealistic to some extent. It's not life. But that is, that is more about the mood. And it's one level of how we can define happiness. So this uh, definition of, um, uh, of emotions. And to kind of like finish quickly all my Greek um, you know, references for today, uh, I'll add that actually, what is happiness? It's a question that we've been asked since the beginning. You know, in 2,500 years ago, Aristotle asked the same question. Yes. And his answer came from this idea or this concept of eudaimonia, which means and has been kind of like translated uh, by saying uh, living well and doing well, which is, again, I think for me, it's a wonderful way of saying it's not only about your individual well-being, but it's mm -hmm. also about your social connections and how how well you're actually doing in relation to others. And that's where the idea of purpose and the idea of living a, perf a life with purpose comes from. And that's another way of looking at, at happiness. Uh, but most often when you hear well-being specialists talking about happiness, what they actually talk about is life satisfaction. Mm. And you already mentioned the, the United Nations happiness report, and that is based on one of the measures of life satisfaction that is called country ladder. And it's a simple question that says, imagine your life being a ladder with steps from zero to 10, zero being the worst possible life, 10 being the best possible life. Where do you think you sit on that ladder? And that is actually much more stable than we would think. Mm -hmm. And one of the kind of like one, probably the most often used headline in press around the World Happiness Report this year was the world is the happiness, the world's happiness is more resilient than we thought it would be. It's interesting, isn't it? Because I wonder with that point about um, the ladder, whether part of the negativity comes with seeing others as further up that ladder, the, 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 high, the longer that ladder in your mind becomes, as it were, the more we see Instagrams of people leading perfect lives, the further away from that perfection we feel. Whereas if actually everyone's a little bit miserable or we know everyone's in it, you know, maybe we feel a bit closer together. I don't, I don't know whether that's, but it, it, it strikes me that, and I've certainly read things where it is, as you say, relations to others, relation to, to the, the norm. If you want to be happy, you know, be the richest man in a poor village or be the, you know, richest in the widest sense of the word. So, yeah, that's I don't true. know what you think. Of that. No, that's true. And inequality and perception of inequality, you know, is actually an important driver of, of happiness. And I think one of the um, things that surprised me and I'm still digging, you know, I think probably need yeah. a couple more weekends in the United Nations. Happiness report. A bit of... It is a bit of reading, but one of the things that they mentioned is that countries like the US where the perceived inequality is quite mm. high, people have lost more well-being. And I mm. think it's absolutely right. In, um, somebody was commenting today on LinkedIn about, again, how, um, what is behind the average in the happiness and how wide that, uh, scale is actually in some people's minds and countries like Denmark that are perceived as more equal yeah. than mean, so not the average, than mean, is above seven. 
that is, you know, so most of the people in that country are actually very close to one of the steps of the ladder. And yeah. that, that is important. No, it is. And I think one of the, one of the trends that people are observing with COVID, right, is the, the increasingly K-shaped world that we live in is, is it prizes inequality further apart rather than this idea at the beginning that we were all in it together. Well, you know, sadly, sadly we're not. But I suppose it also begs the question, and just to, to move into this, I mean, why is happiness important? Why on earth, you know, why is, is it for some people something that it's worth government measuring? Why is it, um, you know, is it not just another emotion that, that, you know, we could have, are you in love or, you know, do you, do you, do you feel, you know, pleasantly surprised? I don't know. Well, you mentioned already that GDP um, is not enough yeah. to express and, you know, how well a nation is doing. And we have had examples in the last 10, 15 years from the um, Arab Spring, where it actually showed some really interesting uh, data. Because if you looked at, I think it was Egypt in, in that analysis, their GDP has grown constantly year on year. But they're actually the percentage of people thriving, which is the percentage of people who answer seven plus to that country yeah. ladder, was dropping. And right. there was, you know, and there was begging the question, what is happening? Yeah. You know, yeah. What is driving the unhappiness? And there are also examples like South Korea, countries who have, you know, um, lived a, a total revolution in terms of uh, economic development, but they haven't translated that into well-being into living better. So these questions have started. And I think there are bigger questions in the economic world around what is the relationship between profit and purpose? Yeah. You know, also how we can live well and not destroy the planet. You know, yeah. and this is where um, concepts like the donut economy um, are coming into place. And governments have already started thinking GDP is not enough. We have to look at other, um, other measures. And life yeah. satisfaction is a brilliant measure to actually understand how well we translate our wealth in well-being. And that's why you know, New Zealand has adopted a well-being framework uh, in the government. There are other countries um, that have adopted similar, similar measures. The UK has uh, yeah. been measuring well-being for a, for a while now and is looking at these indicators as well. And I think there are going to be more and more um, countries that are going to understand that happiness and understanding, and it's not about happiness um, as, an, as an end. You know, it, that's not the objective. Yeah. And we have to be clear. What I think this framework gives so well is a, a way of looking at why do we have these differences? You know, Yes. Why, how can we explain the differences among the 150 countries in the, in the World Happiness Report? And actually what explains those differences? You know, there are kind of like six factors okay. that the, the authors explain the difference. Yeah. And you'll have there a couple of um, factors that you would expect, you know, being in a wealthy country helps, you know, okay. because, you know, GDP uh, per capita helps because that also translates in access to high quality healthcare. And that, uh, that is linked to your life expectancy. But there is a set of factors that are subjective factors that don't have anything to do economics, you know? And one of them you already kind of like alluded to it is the social support. Yeah. Um, is perception of corruption. Yes, I Or lack of corruption in that, in that country. And we've seen that how people in different countries fare differently COVID and we can go back yeah. to that. Um, there is also the perception of freedom to take your own choices and um, the way you and the way you perceive generosity of others, you know, how generous you think your society is. And just to give you a, um, uh, an indicator of that, feeling that your lost wallet is going to be returned if found either by the police or a neighbor or a stranger is more important to your happiness than your income 
for your employment status or even the risk, a serious risk to your health. So we're all very connected and you know, the social support is very important. That's incredible. So that sense of, and trust is a word. I mean, certainly as I read, read through the report and you touched on that with corruption, you know, trust in, in the, the kind of uh, the frameworks, the social frameworks around you, but also in, in sense that generosity is, is trust in others to a degree as well, isn't it? I mean, if yeah. you lose your wallet and someone picks it up and, and brings it to you, that, that is a sense that you are being supported. There's a lot in that. Um, no. that I think is fascinating. And I know that one of the things from the psychology work we do on, on um, human nature and understanding pandemics has been to reveal that, you know, one thing that definitely takes a hit in pandemics is misinformation and, and trust. Because as we can see, um, political figures, um, whether at one extreme are suggesting you might be injecting Dettol, a great, you know, ad for Dettol, but not very sensible thing to do um and others are questioning you know vaccines which again i think the evidence suggests may be um totally unrealistic but but there's a lot of damage to trust isn't there going on at the moment and that's beyond the pandemic i think there's that that's a more endemic challenge to society today Sorry, that wasn't a question. It's a, That's a big topic. It's a big trust. Yeah. It's a big topic. And I think, you know, when we talk about building back. Yes. You know, I think that is an important topic for companies, for, you know, for government organization and for the individuals. And I think you're right. You know, at the end of the day, uh, any uh, lockdown or prevention program, you know, is as good as my trust that if I do the right thing, my fellow citizen will also do the right thing. Yes. So yes. otherwise, you know, and, and that also has some connections to communications, you know, and that's why they were talking about just saying, oh, always seeing in the news, oh, nobody's respecting the rules. Everybody's out, you know, walking where they shouldn't. It's kind of like saying, oh, well, so that everybody does it. So why shouldn't I? Because it's, it affects my trust in, again, in my community. Exactly. But I think what was interesting in the, um, uh, in the United Nations Happiness Report, and what we're seeing um, after COVID is that it's almost like there are two types of trust. Okay. Uh, and for me personally, it's interesting because one part of trust is the how strong your connections are with your close knit, you know, with your family and friends, yeah. and that is very yeah. true for what sociologists call um, uh, collectivistic societies and but south america is definitely in that category and we have seen when we studied the um, uh, chronic skin diseases that actually living in one of those countries for people living with a, with a chronic skin condition was a better protector of their happiness and uh, in comparison to living in a richer country so people living with psoriasis in mexico were happier than people living with psoriasis in denmark even though that's a much happier country. And that's mainly because, you know, living in a collectivistic society is better for your mental health than living in a highly individualistic society where one of the things is that there's a lot of pressure on your self-image and it's a skin condition and it impact, impacts how you, what you look like. Oh, yes. So it was interesting to see that that was kind of preserved in the in the pandemic mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but what was lost was the other type of uh support in some well, sorry other type of trust in other countries and that was the trust in your government okay but yeah. that was the more general social uh yeah. trust and that's what the latin america or the south america seems to have lost yes and in you know in um in contradiction to that that's what some of the uh, East Asia countries did very well. And that's why apparently, you know, they fared the, the pandemic better and they lost less well-being in that respect. So for me, that's very interesting because that also has um, uh, ramifications around how do we engage with companies who are interested in 
looking at happiness? What do we learn for the healthcare systems that have been, you know, differently impacted across the countries? And it offers a different lens and raises big questions around what is trust? How do we engage with people? Yeah. What is important to, to build? Yes. And I mean, let's face it. I think there are a lot of, there's a, there's a mistrust of, of politicians often. And again, I mean, I'm speaking from a very Western, more individualistic perspective, and I mustn't fall into the trap of projecting that onto to sort of every part of the world. As you say, collectivist countries have, have a very different perspective, perhaps. But I do see, um, you know, if you take some of the social media giants, you know, that th there is perhaps a lack of lack of trust there uh, and, and i think it's interesting apple are playing big on this idea of privacy mm. as a competitive advantage over the kind of googles and the facebook's of course of the world so um let's turn turn to that because i think for especially for our audience and a lot of people are from um private companies i mean are there do you see a gap basically between individuals and let's face it you know i guess we all have a certain um degree of responsibility for our own happiness it's not entirely in the agency of others though often it is that's an important part and challenge me if that's that's mm -hmm. wrong but then at governments at the the other side so you've got almost this this sort of the the individual and your your kind of close network and then you've got government can should companies be trying to encourage happiness to to facilitate that enable it well what i work for happiness i would probably say yes yeah. you know, sure. <laughs> well, of course they should but it's not as simple as that and yeah. i totally agree i think in the last um five ten years we have seen interesting advances and kind of uh, increased awareness of the importance of happiness at an individual level mm -hmm. you know and uh, we all probably know more than we knew five years ago around the links between mental health and physical health, you know, how to manage stress and the role of stress or how to embrace mindfulness or, you know, other kind of like um, applied psychology or positive psychology measures. Yeah. I think it's, it's good and it's happening. And like we were talking earlier, you know, at the government level, this is an increased awareness and um, kind of like openness to, okay, so, okay, what is it? How can we use that? Yeah. But I, I think you're right, there is a gap in the middle. And that's where probably a lot of interesting work is going to happen in the next yeah. five to 10 years. I think happiness can almost be a competitive advantage. You know, it, it almost can be fueling innovation, but also creating a more authentic, new kind of social contract. Yes. Between yes. companies and individuals. Because I think what we've learned, one of the things we've learned this, um, this pandemic is that people I work with are not my family. And that's okay, you know? Yeah. They are yeah. my team. You know, the family is the, you know, the um, old parent we're worried about or the kid running through the Zoom call. That is family, we all learned in that. So it's kind of like, okay, so then what can we expect from each other. It's almost like, I think in many cases, we're suddenly um, seen again as adults in yeah. relation to our companies, you know, because we were expected to do uh, what is right. And, you know, people did that. Yes, you have to trust. And I think that one of the, you know, the biggest barriers to working from home wasn't a lack of technology, wasn't a lack of um, regulatory, internal regulatory ability. It was a lack of trust, right? I, as a boss, I, as a manager, didn't trust that my, my team were going to go home and do the work. I thought they were going to be, I don't know. I don't know what people thought, yeah. but why, A, why hire people you don't trust? Don't get me started on that. You have to, you have to trust the people you hire. But to me, it was a fundamental lack of trust. And what's happened is people have realized that, you know, they, they, if they do trust their employees, then this, this can work. Now, we know that there are things, don't we, that people do want to get back into social environments and people do want to 
um, work. But I think we've, we've fundamentally, for most companies, and I'd be interested actually, if there's anyone on the, uh, you know, watching who's working in a company that is mandating a full-time return to the office, because I know Goldman Sachs have come out and said, DJ Sol has said it doesn't work, right? It doesn't work. It, 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 but is, is that really right? Is every other company that's mandating a, uh, a kind of more flexible policy? Um, yeah. So I've got, I've got someone saying, uh, Angeliki is, is saying, I, I have this experience. So, you know, where, where do, do we see anything in the data about happiness and flexibility? I mean, is this trust in your, your employer and your sh employer showing trust in you? Does that make you happier? Actually, on the list of factors that um, helped uh, mediating loss of well-being, supportive management and flexible work are included. So yeah. I think, again, you know, allowing people to be the masters or their own lives yeah. contributed to that. But somehow, you know, you, um, you kind of like make the same mistake. You ask the question, what companies should do? Yes. But I think we have to start with... Uh, what questions we should ask, but also being very open and ready to listen. Because I actually, as I said, I did some homework because, and I know that I, one of my peeps kind of like topics is everybody has innovation in their role, you know, yeah. these days. So we kind of, in the last three years, we used it to, I don't know, you know, smear everything. And I'm worried now that it's going to, the same is going to happen with happiness. Yes, yes. And, you know, and I, I think last year I saw one of the uh, big consultancies coming out with a report on well-being. And I'm like, OK, if McKinsey got this, we're doomed. Suddenly it's going to be mainstream. Everybody is going to have a chief happiness officer, but without asking the right questions. And what and are the, yeah. the big? So the big, but when we start with the question what companies should do, we will get the mandate that we need to have a chief happiness officer and that person is going to take care of our Friday um, drinks and it's going to make sure that we have some volunteering days every year and she's going to take, or he, she is going to take yeah. care of our um, happiness moments like work anniversaries. I'm yeah. not even making this up. I checked LinkedIn yesterday. <laughs> so it's like, you know, and my first reaction is like, these activities are good. Are they good for the morale? But actually, you know, do you know what is the difference in happiness between different groups in your company? You know, yeah. are you ready to look at why? And I have, you know, I'll take a wild guess. Why women maybe are less happy than the rest of the organization? Is this something in the way you promote people? Or are there differences in happiness between more diverse teams and less diverse teams? You know, you have to ask the question, what drives happiness? Yes. You know, and what, what is our role in, in, this, um, in this, in driving your happiness as your employer? It has to be an open discussion and can change the whole culture. And I think we were talking about this. One yes. of our yeah, we were before. You know, because yeah. there's also respect and how individuals, how much individuals want to share. Exactly. But without the fear of being, you know, shamed or stigmatized for that. Yeah. And I mean, I think I was expressing a, a, a view that for me at Brand Genetics, I'm always aware of where we overstep or, or shouldn't overstep the mark. I mean, is it our job to we know relationships are hugely important. I mean, one of the biggest factors in whether you're happy at work is do you have a friend at work? That's true. You know, that, that, so, but, and we can facilitate that in different ways. But, you know, if you split up with your girlfriend or your boyfriend, is that our role then to get involved? And I, I feel uncomfortable about that. Other people feel hugely comfortable with, with, with sharing. So, so that, that's great. But um, I think we have to, you know, we're small enough that we can tailor, tailor that. But when you get to a big corporate environment, I think there, there are, with, with this knowledge comes greater responsibility, it almost feels, because what you're suggesting to me is start with not by window dressing with a chief happiness officer and saying, yes, we're going to have some away days and do some volunteering. 
you know, that may be useful, but actually first start with a diagnostic. Where are the issues? Where can you, and, but, but I can imagine some companies don't want to scratch that because the minute they understand it, right? There are, they, they have to potentially feel they do something about it. No, and again, that's, what, that's why what I was talking about, you know, being ready to take the, the tough decisions so or look at yourself in the mirror. Are we actually ready in some companies to redefine productivity? Yeah. You know, because one, one of the ways we, uh, again, one of the things we've learned in the pandemic is maybe the way we define productivity or productive hours has to be redefined. Maybe we can ask about, you know, how much well-being do we actually create internally and externally? Yeah. You know, I mean, that is kind of like my, my, my dream project, you know, we kind of like work with a company who is willing to look at, do we create or destroy well-being on our supply chain, you know, uh, or yeah. how important well-being is for our um, customers or users. <laughs> This is fascinating. So this is for you, this, this, it feels, and I, I buy into this, this idea that actually treat happiness as people are increasingly treating sustainability. You know, you look at your sustain, your sustainability isn't just whether you put it in a, I don't know, your product in a recycled cardboard pack, you have to go right back to your supply chain, right? And what we're, what I think you're advocating for, which I, I, I think is really, really challenging, but really positive, is to say, look at the, the, the happiness, the impact you create down the supply chain, but also in your end customer. Is there a duty of care to your end customer, your end user or consumer, whoever you kind of term that human being at the end, that if you are a Robin Hood or a TikTok, and I'm not saying that those are bad companies, but maybe some negative outcomes occur, mm -hmm. then like a Hippocratic oath, do you have to sort of do no, first do no harm? Yeah. yeah. And I think well-being can play a role in that. And, you know, and there are smarter people than me that say that. And there was a conference last year that actually asked this question, is happiness the new frontier in sustainable uh, yeah. development goals? Because what happened with the sustainable development goals to some extent, you know, they, they have been treated, unfortunately, by some as a menu. You know, I'll have saving the pandas and you'll have yeah. I don't know, planting trees, which should be how it's all connected. And yeah. I think what kind of like asking the question, do we create or destroy well-being for the present and future generations? Yeah. Can inform and impact the way we take decisions across the organization. And that's why going back to kind of like the chief happiness officer, you know, it is, I think it can be a superpower, you know, to, yes. to change the way companies work. But what we do now is a little bit in many cases, not in all the cases, but in many cases, it feels a little bit like, you know, you're, you're getting this purebred horse and then you use it to give kids rides on the beach. <laughs> no, it's like you, it's, or it's, it's, we have to do better than that. I, I think I think you're so right, and I, I I love the I love the analogy. It's um, and, and look, I, first of all, I'm just gonna to the to the pan to the not the panel, the the participants. Please do put questions in the chat or or the Q and A. I've got both open, so that's why my eyes are flicking back and forth between, but. If you have questions for Catalina or, or for me, but Catalina is probably much better place to answer the difficult ones, um, the, uh, then please do, do pop them in. But I, I think what I'm, this idea of um, the world is enthralled to technology companies, right? It seems to me that the, the, the big four of Google, Apple, Facebook, um, Amazon, you know, they're just, these trillion multi-billion dollar company and yet they seem to have this philosophy of, of rushing things out you know um, move fast and break things I think Facebook used to say and if you have an impact on I mean I think Facebook's across half the world's population give or take if you have an impact on that amount of people do you not have to act in a similar way to an engineer building a bridge or to a 
um, to a product designer putting something out into market. I mean, you're from healthcare. I mean, you absolutely have to go through tests, but no one in a CPG, FMCG type business the, of the types that a lot of our clients are in can, can put a product out on the market without proper testing. Whereas I think this sort of model of beta testing, which in innovation, and a lot of this audience are sort of from the world of innovation, is becoming increasingly popular. So I just, it strikes me that one of the measures on that should surely be your impact on well-being, your impact on happiness. Mm. But um, yeah, I don't know what you think on that and whether that's realistic. You know, I don't know enough about these big companies uh, yeah. internal, internal workings on how they develop their strategies of expansion, for instance. But I think there is, there is a bigger question around the duty of care. And I yeah. think we are going to hear more about that in the context of building back better or even building back happier. And I think there is, we have a responsibility, you know, and, you know, my, um, my friend Jun, Jenny Winhorn, who is a brilliant innovator, and she's my go-to person when talking about system innovation. Okay. You know, she explains that um, she uses this methodology when uh, um, engaging with companies, thinking of their future plans. And she actually asks managers to start with a future, a future vision and then work your way back through the consequences of the steps you have to take mm -hmm. to get to that big shiny ambition of being the biggest best whatever company in the real. world because you know and suddenly you know using that methodology you know actually you make people more aware of the fact that maybe the cost of that success is affecting the well-being of a community or making so i think we just have to look at the at the world a little bit differently and i think again i would give more credit to individuals you know the way we engage with uh, with technology and the mm -hmm. way we kind of judge you know what what we see uh, yeah and I, again and i think we are going to to spot the genuine companies that are really do really want to do better and the companies who are just for the the show there you know and looking for instance at the b corp model yes that has been growing fantastically in the last couple of years i think more and more companies want to ask these questions you know yeah. we we want what is the what is the um correct balance between profit and purpose you know yeah. what and because at the end of the day i think that is a very serious question about do we want to be here long term and what does it take to get there it's not only about the next quarter's results when we look at things like that so right. i think i think and we cannot talk about future and success without looking at people and the you know people working for you people buying your products Yes. People that produce your your products and in in the supply chain and everything, and we have to understand what is our impact and how well, we can make it better. And I think we're starting to see. I mean, um, when when the financial institutions get involved in these things, I think we're starting to see various nods towards a wider description of stakeholders than just shareholder value, right? Mm. And I think when that happens, it starts to get interesting. When people start to say, you know, what is the what is the value this company is adding, not just to its shareholders, but mm. to its community. It, yeah. the, the, and that, you know, involves a, a much wider definition. Can I can I ask a couple of questions that have come in? So I'm going to um, I'm going to just Start because Angeliki was was kind enough to put her hand up, as it were, and say, "Look, this is my um, this is my situation in terms of, of working from home uh, and and being being asked or being being kind of enforced to come back." Do you have a sense? And this this may be a personal opinion, it may be a professionally informed opinion. Do you have any sense on what that right balance seems to be between? Um, flexibility and, and being in the office and working from home. Is, is there any evidence that we're seeing at the moment as to 
what that right model might be for companies and, and their employees? You know, I, I use one of the one of the things I've learned in my MBA, you know, just answer just answer, it depends. <laughs> it always depends. Um, yeah. Well, because it also, again, makes me think of my Danish colleagues. Yes. That I think, and it's, I, I always say, you know, I think everybody should work for a Danish company now and then because, <laughs> because, of, because of this very healthy attitude that people can decide for themselves. Yes. And I think, I think it depends because each person's situation is different. And the way I think we're going to, we're going to end up with a combination of let's agree on, on a number of days we all want to be in the office so we can have meetings and we yeah. can you know discuss face to face things that cannot be replicated in a in a zoom call and then everybody will have the flexibility to work from wherever yeah fits you know we have we have young uh, colleagues with small children who literally you know it's kind of like i cannot work from home Please yes. allow me to come back to the office. Yes. It's better for me. And we had we have colleagues with a long commute or you know who cannot travel, like me, in the, the many yeah. people in this situation yeah. that work from home. And you know what and you still feel that you're part of the team and you you work with that. And I think that's how you're going to get the best out of your out of your team. It's just how you bring that to your leaders and how you create that conversation. I think, again, it depends probably on the culture and on the expectations, but you, we've all probably seen the, uh, the headlines that the junior um, analyst in Goldman Sachs yes. made last week or this week, you know, and they had a short PowerPoint and they said, this cannot continue. You know, yeah. this is yeah. what the numbers look like and we have to do something about it. No, and I think, I mean, my take on it, if I, if I may, Angeliki and, and Catalina, um, is, is I think there's a dif difficulty for companies because the average sort of suits no one. You're going to have people like, you know, young people who are eager to learn, who want to be sociable, who want to be around, you know, senior people almost to, to absorb, because I think so much when you're young is not, you know, in formal training, but is in that sort of just that, that hearing others on the phone or um, how they converse in meeting. So I think you're going to have at one end people who really want to be in and then maybe the people who've been there and done that and as you say maybe they've moved out of town and they've they've got a family and actually they'd rather be in the office much less. So when you mandate then sort of two or three days you end up potentially pleasing kind of neither. But I think what you're saying which I, I do buy is it's it's treating people as adults and it's also respecting that they get because to me the office doesn't work unless when you you know i don't want to go in the office by and large to have a meeting with myself you know i i i go in the office to see the team to talk with them to bump into people and have a social chat but also have a work chat um and if i if i turn up and there's no one there it's a bit of a wasted journey for me you know so I think that there has, the hybrid thing is going to be very interesting, he says in inverted commas, but also I think it's going to be tricky because I think this is, we're trying to find this Goldilocks idea of it's just right. And I think that we're going to struggle for a little while at any rate. Um, so these are my watch outs, if you will. We're going to struggle for a little while on what is right, what is too much, what is too little, and, and where that chafes. Because it's, you know, it, Certainly, I'll speak from just personal experience in, in my company and, and in many of the clients that we've worked with, people are all at home. And that's fine because you have a meeting and it's all over Zoom and that's great or Teams or whatever, pick your, pick your poison. Um, I think it'll be very interesting when half that team are in a meeting room and the other half are, so, you know, how does that work? Are you, are you disenfranchised? Are you like Rachel at Friends who decides she has to take up smoking again to go and get into where all the decisions are made? Do you feel you, you're missing out? So I think we're in for a tricky time, but I do feel that back to, to echo Catalina, your points, trust, showing trust, showing respect and treating people as adults, come back to that, is, is the critical 
kind of pace. And I think as a discipline, you know, kind of like employing well-being measures or asking these different types of questions have the potential to become a, a competitive advantage. You know, it's almost like the best work in service design as a discipline development, you know, was done in the stealth mode. Yes. You know, nobody, and I think it's going to be similar. You know, there are companies that work already only four days a week. Yes, yes. And it's happening. And it's not, it's not necessarily in the news every day. So I think we're going to see this almost like shoots of innovation that will be used by companies in terms of how they, because on one hand, I do understand companies, you know, sometimes, especially in um, professional services, the way we do things and the way we deliver a service can be part of our DNA. Yeah. So it's, it's tricky. You kind of want to tell people what to do because that's what you're selling, right, to your client. But I think that is going to, that is going to be challenged. And again, we're, we're back to what is the social contract between a company and its employees. And yeah. I think as employees, we have the opportunity to have a bigger role in that debate and contribute more. And kind of like saying, you know, saying productivity can mean finishing a task at 8 p.m. after I put my kids to bed. Yes. And I'm happy to do that. So why not? So it, I yeah. think it's going, to be, it's going to be a continuous dialogue. And I think we're going to see some surprises on the way. Absolutely. Now, just to come back to the, when we touched on um, the Global Happiness Report, Andrew Christophers is asking, you know, has, the over, has overall global happiness fallen in the past year? So for those people who haven't spent, like you, the weekend glued to the Global Happiness Report, can you just give us a sort of summary? Because I think it's, having, having kind of read it in, in you know, a, a little bit, I think it's super interesting what, what some of the big findings have been. We, we touched upon uh, some, of the, yes. some of the headlines already. So overall, the happiness levels have not uh, dropped dramatically. I think the global average was lost only uh, two points. Yes. So, you know, so something, something minimal. But what is interesting is looking beyond that, you know, because some countries lost well-being and some countries and some groups uh, did better. To give you an example, um, what is interesting is that different demographics and different social uh, demographic groups have definitely uh, responded differently. Um, in the UK, for instance, we have this, what is called the U curve, uh, the happiness levels by age. You know, you're basically, you're happy when you're young and then your happiness drops when you're 30, 40, and it starts when you basically have kids and a lot of costs to pay. And then it, uh, it starts um, growing again after, the, after your 60s. But while now we have a slope. Yeah. You know, young people have lost a lot of well being and have consistently reporting um, lower happiness levels. What is interesting is that um, the older people actually report that their happiness, their health, has been better than usual, which it can be surprising. Yes. But it is because it is, again, talking about psychology, in the context of COVID, other health problems seem less important. So it's almost like a moving standard there. Um, the, the countries that, um, uh, like I said, you know, have uh, been perceived as being more in control of the pandemic have fared better than countries where people thought that their governments haven't managed it uh, very well. Um, the um, social support and the role of that uh, was also very, uh, very important. And there was one other thing that was, wait, I have it here. And I've just put it in the, just whilst you're, you're looking, yeah. I've just put it in the chat actually, a link as well, because I oh, think- Oh, that's great. For anyone who wants to, um, there's a very good overview. You don't have to delve into the whole thing, but I found it a very, I suppose it made me feel quite positively actually about humanity, that we were so resilient, 
mm. um, in the face of this. But I found there's some really interesting insights, and you've touched on on, on many of them. I, I think um, you know it, it felt it, it felt like it was it was unexpected, which, as you say, the headlines have all been no, you know, not much change. Yeah. And it made, it made me happy to see that headline yeah. because basically I was thinking I was going to make my work a little bit easier. Yeah. Because no, I am, if you like, I'm trying to sell happiness to mainly the healthcare system. Yes. And they are, you know, driven by objective, evidence-based hard science. Yes. And one of the big things, you know, when kind of like going back to where we start, you know, one of the big pushbacks I get is, Happiness is way too volatile. It cannot be, you know, life satisfaction is not a stable measure. And, you know, I can go and say, listen, if a pandemic yes. cannot move us, we probably, you know, should address, should consider this a little bit more seriously. But again, for me, it's the whole richness of insights that is behind the, the headlines and looking how, for instance, you know, that was the other thing that, um, stood up for me in the, in, the, uh, in the report. Social media was on two lists, on both you know, uh, parts of the- Made you happy, made you sad. Made you happy, made you sad. You know, it can be, uh, and obviously you know, using social media helped us stay connected and that contributed to our happiness. Yeah. But it can also drag you into you know, a spiral of fake news or yeah. sad news that will affect your mental health and well-being. So it is at the end of the day what we make with those and how we can put them, you know, to serve people. Guys, we're coming up to the uh, to time. So please do fire in any further questions. Um, I'm feeling very lucky that I'm having this chance to have a conversation with you, Catalina, but I, I, I do encourage any of the rest of you out there to, to, to fire your questions over. I mean, I, I think um, this idea, which I, I posited to the, the, the Global Innovation Forum a couple of years back about innovating for happiness. I mean, one thing innovators are always looking for is an unmet need. Mm -hmm. And it seems that in many places, the world, you know, the world was not a happy place. And actually, if you can do a bit to enable more happiness, more a, you know that better better sort of life experience just in a little way make your consumers smile mm -hmm. when they in, and enjoy your product then actually i think there's a lot of evidence that shows that you can not only get a um, more more repetition people coming back to you greater loyalty in essence but also that uh, people will pay a more of a premium mm -hmm. I, you know I, I think that's probably not surprising, but it, it's not something that I think a lot of people have on their innovation scorecard, you know, does this make people happy? So, um, and, yeah. and I think we're back to the sustainable goals. Yes. I think we have learned in the last years, you know, the price we pay for a non-sustainable supply chain or a non-sustainable product. And people are more and more aware of the impact we have on the planet. It's a, it's a matter of how we're going to be able to translate that in a business proposition and a successful business proposition. And I think it's the same, again, the same way. It, it can be a competitive advantage, mm. but we have to be ready to ask the, the bigger questions. And we also have to understand that it's not down to one company. It cannot be down to one company mm -hmm. the same way it cannot be down to one individual you know i think it's going to take a consistent and kind of like concerted um, effort from governments because we do need regulation and we do need policy frameworks to make that happen you know maybe we should think about the the danone uh, danone uh, news as well you know because they have embraced the b corp uh, framework and saying we're going to care about all our stakeholders, not only our shareholders. Yes. But that was not enough, you know, to some of the, the shareholders. How do we mitigate that? You know, and at the end of the day, um, we want these different groups to communicate. You know, it's going to be a negotiation. How do we negotiate? How do we facilitate the conversation between the different stakeholders that we have? You know, who takes the decision? 
at the end of the day. We can say yeah. that, yes, we want to have a positive impact on all our stakeholder groups, but what is the what is the platform? How are we actually going to make it happen? To put those voices together, and then who takes the decision in the end? How do we mitigate and how do we facilitate that negotiation? Yes, yes. I think I mean one of the one of the happy stories that I saw recently in the press, and it it comes from a place of empathy. I think I mean I I feel empathy is is a critical skill for any innovator. I think it's um, a critical skill for the human race that we're sadly sort of some, somehow losing. There is an empathy deficit. Um, but I think even more so in the current environment, it, it, it's sort of critical. And the, the story I, I um, was Disney and Philips teaming up. And I don't know whether you saw this, it's the world of healthcare, but in, to, in MRI scanners, and I know this has been done before, um in i think ge had an mri but they've created these stories for kids going into mri scanners which are incredibly scary if anyone's been in an mri they'll know it's noisy it's claustrophobic you know this is not a nice place to be and you've got to lie still and they've created these wonderful storylines tapping into those disney stories and to me you know that's not there's nothing clinically kind of being improved there. I mean, there are sedation levels, I suspect, that come down for kids and things like that. But that to me comes from a place of not just how do we build the best MRI scanner at Philips, but actually how do we create an experience that's positive for people? And I think that that's, you know, that's what we're talking about to an extent. I mean, or one example. And VR actually plays an interesting role in oh, yeah. making some of these interventions easier for kids and adults alike. But I think when we talk about technology and healthcare, we're back to what um, Rafael Grossman said yesterday in his, uh, his webinar, you know, technology should only help us be more human. Yes. Because I at the end that. of the day, you know, and from a happiness perspective, and kind of like bring it back to, to, uh, to healthcare, if you like. Um, we have seen in our data that thinking that your doctor understands the impact the disease has on your mental health is directly uh, connected to your happiness. So kind of like, you know, think about it. Just thinking that your doctor sees you as a person, not as a disease, already creates well-being. And I think that's, that's wonderful. And that's what we should look at, you know, technology or not technology on how we want to build our products and services. Well, Catalina, I think that's a wonderful note to end it on. So we should be seeing all of us, whether you're in healthcare or in finance or in consultancy or client side, see your the human being at the end of, you know, at the end of the service or the product you offer. See them as a human being like you. Have empathy care for their their needs and and i think that will that will lead you to being a better innovator a better a better sort of um marketer or worker or designer whatever whatever you are catalina i i just want to say thank you so much for your time it's been fascinating i know that the uh, the group have, have enjoyed it as some of you who are, are regulars will know there's normally a wonderful um scribe drawing um, away here and sadly schedules didn't allow um i've done a i've done a very poor um impression so i think chris and, and his team but it, you do look happy you do look I happy. Do, I do. that's captured that's good that's good i'll it, take that exactly um what i would say though and and i think it's in the the uh, chat but you know all their recordings of all these sessions we've had morton bond from lego we've had dr Raphael grossman from uh, you know, healthcare futurist and surgeon, uh, and we've had Catal Catalina Chernica um, uh, today, and recordings will be on the YouTube channel. A huge thank you to you, Catalina, to everyone attending, and I'd just like to say, please go away, spread a little happiness, and be happy yourselves, and be safe. Thank, thank you all very much.